Now, one of the great things about historians is that you can out of their back. I saw him years ago. Okay, good evening, everyone. It's very, uh, it's very, very good for us to have this evening. It's not, in, they met, it's not, not exactly the prettiest weather, so we should call Chaco Fechem Hamash for making this happen. For the show, this is a very uh, interesting. We didn't realize it'd be like this, but tomorrow we're Metzayanin, we're pointing Metzayanin. You'll see, it again happens to us today. Metzayanin, we're marking um, one year to being in the show. Shabbat Hagabar last year was when we came in. And it's been a very, very beautiful year and a very, very busy year, Ruch Hashem with a tremendous amount of activity, a tremendous amount of learning, a tremendous amount of all different types of events, all different types of events. Um, let's say that the sort of, of kind of, of capping the year with um, having the event that we wanted to do this evening, uh, in memory of the Rav Azir to be for the month Pesach, it's a very big sport for us. It's a very big spot uh, personally to, uh, for me to have um, the privilege of being surrounded by so many people in my life over the years that have played really big roles that have been yonek, they've been they received their Masora and their love and passion of Masora from the Rav. We're in a town, the Asra Atami of the Rav. My Rosh Yeshiva, where I went to here in Efrat, Shabbat Amiftar, a Talmud of the Rav. And it's just a very, it's a very beautiful and special time that we have to mark this 30th year, I'd say. And we're surrounded by people here in Efrat, or Hashem, who have a lot, a lot to share, <coughs> a lot to share with us. So I'm, I'm first of all very thankful for our, our very special Rabbanim and our guests that are here with us to share tonight. I'm just going to be introducing each person, each Rab. And if it's okay, uh, I would like to start with Rabbi Professor Jeffrey Wolf, who the second that I had, the second that we started speaking about this idea, started discussing this idea with Rabbi Van Adler. And it was like, uh, uh, it was a no brainer that like, you have to speak. Professor Wolf, and the second that I reached out was such a uh, such a beautiful uh, reception to it. So I, I thank you so much. And um, most of you already know how Rabbi Wolf is an internationally known scholar, lecturer, and public figure, and is an associate professor in the Talmud Department at Bar-Ilan University, specializing in history of Alaha, medieval and Renaissance and Jewish history, and philosophy of the Rav, and the interaction between Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. Received his PhD in medieval Jewish history at Harvard University and spent two years at Yale University as a postdoc. Let me feel cool. This is a very cool for me to see this. But the most important thing for tonight is that Rabbi Wolf, I, I don't know if I got this right, studied just maybe 10 years with the Rabbi and has written extensively. And for us, it's a tremendous host to hear from uh, Professor Jeffrey Wolf. I feel a little funny because uh, I'm the first person to uh, uh, acknowledge the fact that um, Rabbi Schrader and Rabbi Burzan uh, and Afar were good Talmudic Chacham in Menaya, and I am the only person I know who could us uh, uh, And Elon had, uh, had such a uh, an, had a unique take on uh, on the road from his specific uh, from his specific viewpoint. It's hard for me to you know lead off. Um, I had this course of uh, studying with the Rav for nine and a half years, but not by going through the usual cursus uh, honorary that they say around the usual uh, line of, uh, of, uh, of study. As a uh, native Bostonian, uh, the Rav was uh, much more uh, accessible, but I didn't grow up in the Maimonides uh, community. 
I had the uh, unique source, and it's an opportunity for me to publish it in some way. That um, what year was it? I was the I was studying at the Boston Hebrew Teachers College, and I was uh, in the class of Rabbi David Shapiro. And at one point, I asked him uh, what the place to go to go learn would be for the summer, and he said, "Where is going to go?" And he and together with me and uh, Rabbi Walton was uh, Ishaya Walton was later kind of Rafa um, made it possible, and uh, that was one of the most transformative uh, moments in my life because they wanted to share, and I have it I, like what I get to Rabbi Shapiro for that uh, for both of those things, the advice and also facilitating uh, that I can never repay um, because my connection with the Rav was for six years in. Uh, in Boston until I went to a local yeshiva in 1978. Um, I, uh, my relationship with him was a lot less um, fraught than what well, Boston boys always get treated with, right? But um, it was less fraught and more intimate. And I had the opportunity to also be a driver for a while. Um, and um, my first encounter with his philosophy, or my major encounter with his philosophy, happened at the same time as I uh, began to undertake my doctoral studies with uh, the Rub's uh, son-in-law, uh, Professor Wright Sartorsky, as I could tell the Rub would talk about it. So that, in a, to a certain degree, my understanding of what the Rub was trying to do philosophically, love this, it was a straight person, but philosophically it was very much uh, um, cast through the prism of uh, Professor Tversky's uh, demand that Hashkafa, the Jewish philosophy, be uh, viewed under what's called the long durée. There's a reason why I'm giving you this whole hadith. Um, there is not a day in my life, either emotionally, religiously, or spiritually, or halakhically, learning-wise, that I don't invoke or don't think of something I've been taught from the Rav. But I would like to emphasize something which I've come to understand uh, over the past, uh, really over the past 15 years more than any other. And that is that the Rav was in many ways prescient, almost, almost prophetic. He was the last person, the last thing he would amount to would say was the weirdest that you're at. But he was prescient, if not prophetic, in terms of what Judaism was going to require in the second half or the second this last quarter of the 20th century, 20th century and the beginning of the 21st century. Uh, people often make the mistake of associating the Rav with his first major essay, A Lachic Man, and identifying him with the very mathematical, almost detached, cold Litvak kind of personality which can emerge from a reading of that, of that essay. That was not the Rav. If you take a look at the um, mass amount of published, and now more things are published, and more importantly, recorded lectures and talks that he issued. There were two things that he tried to inculcate in his audience all the way back from the 40s until, until he retired. Number one is the absolute need for the development of an, of an individual, emotional, experiential relationship with God. It's almost as if he realized that what he wrote in Halachic Man about, 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 the, about the Halachist as a mathematician, the Halachist as a, as, a, as, a, as a very logical and detached individual, required a corrective. Required a corrective because people can get detached and over-intellectualized, and over-intellectualization leads to arrogance, and over-intellectualization leads, uh, uh, leads to judging Torah and like judging God. So the major tropes of all of his teaching subsequently was to, was to balance that, was to correct that, to, 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 first of all, cultivate in every single individual um, an awareness, the imminent awareness of God as the context within which um, a Jew lives. That's my, my take is the reason why it's, we call God Hamakom is because he is the context. 
is the context in which we live. We should be enveloped with his awareness passively as we go through our lives, actively as we study or pray. That in turn vivifies the act of study as an encounter with God. It's not just, in other words, I, I can't I personally can't stand it when people say they're, they're, when I go to when I go to when I, to Yeshiva or I go to or go to Yeshiva, whatever it is, they study text. No. I happen to be a tremendous fan of Dante Alighieri. I have a bust of Dante on my desk. I have three versions of Dante over my desk. Studying the Divine Comedy is a text. Torah is not a text. So that's number one. And the truth of the matter is that the Rub's concern for the um, infusion of the religious gesture and the like, and the and the gesture of the, of the Torah was borne out by the tremendous thirst for an emotional and intimate relationship with God, while not advocating one's mind at the same time, which proved to uh, take over Orthodoxy over the course of the of the nineties and the and this part of the twentieth century. That's number one. Number two, related to that is the need for intellectual humility. There's a famous polemical speech that the Rub gave in 1975, in which he demanded that Jews um, should accept the Torah a priori and work within it to understand it, and not judge the Torah, not judge God. And he invades against those who would render the Torah into some kind of academic uh, a fossil, which can be has to be reduced or should be reduced only to its um, to the to the circumstances of its uh, of its creation, by the Gemara, the Mishnah, whatever, from the, the, the Torah itself, because this is the living word of God, and he harped on this. In fact, recently uh, there's a wonderful um, um, I guess what's his name? Arn, Arn, Dr. Arnold Listiger, who spent a huge, really spent about a decade his life to to spreading the Rose writing. Um, has been uh, digitizing and publishing short clips of uh, the rubs, of, of, of drushes of the rubs in Yiddish that weren't that weren't listed any. One of them recently, about a year ago, that was issued was a direct attack on a direct criticism of purely of substituting purely academic Jewish studies for Torah. Now that can enhance, you can enhance your Torah with historical. He spent his time doing, and even uh, and uh, never mind uh, the rough son, uh, but it remains total in our community. That's a challenge today, the last 10 years. If you listen to the kinds of debates that go on within the Tatilu Lui community, the so many of the so self appointed and so called um. Uh, people who are more progressive will always revert and turn the Torah into a text rather than leaving the Torah. So the rub was ahead of, ahead of his time um, on that uh, on that as well. Um, and just one last thing. I mean, there's just so many, so many things you can say. A Talmud, I'm 16. <laughs> but we know each other 50 years. Um, Rabbi Bruce and I met at the uh, the bus at the Rebbe's uh, basement uh, when the road was finished in the summer. Um, One of the my personal the, the personal this is a personal note. The Rav was the person who literally made it possible for me to be a from Jew. By virtue of giving a personal example, by virtue of encouragement that he gave me in terms of uh, pursuing both a simultaneously a, a rabbinic career and a uh, academic career. But it's more than that, is the sense of being in the 
presence of allowing, of giving the privilege of being in the presence of a person who just towered over um, all of us, but who inspired uh, a profound sense of, uh, of Yerushalayim. Um, when, he, when he spoke to him, and he, uh, even when he spoke, when he taught, um, is something which follows me every, every minute of every, of every day. And um, even in those areas where maybe I don't exactly do what he might have done um, today. Uh, nevertheless, the capacity of a Rebbe to instill his presence on a Talmud, uh, or the ability, the success of a Rebbe to instill himself on his Talmud, on a Talmud is the um, sign of his success. Ironically, the Rebbe thought that he wasn't much of a success. So I can tell him, Rebbe, with me, you were a success in terms of that. Um, and one way to do, and one way that he accompanies me is something that I actually learned from Talmud of his brother. My dear martyred friend, our dear David Applebaum, Shemi from Damon, was a Talmud Muvak of Ben Bayit. I don't know, he was almost an alter ego to Rivard Solovich. When Rivard was nifter, a couple of years before David was murdered, um, I called him up to wish, you know, express my condolences. And and he said, Rabbi didn't die. I'm working either with him because it was all recorded, always able to go back and to have that connection in his imagination. In his um, we all have that possibility because of all the writing and so on. And, uh, and now clear tapes for change. And I encourage everyone to join the ranks of the rest of the meeting or the uh, Salvedon's home meeting. Because there are people who set the agenda for Jewish intellectual and halachic history for centuries after they died. Jewish philosophy is still writing footnotes for the Rambam. And in our community, we are still foot writing footnotes for the Rambam. Thank you so much. So very much. Approximately uh, a little bit less than a year ago, the greater Efrat was, was blessed with the presence of a, of a, a, a tremendous Tamit Chacham, a Rav with, with thousands of Tamidim and Tamidot over the years, and a Chaver Neeman of Arki Lamet Velazaria Berzon. And it's a tremendous host to ask uh, the person to come and share. Uh, in his such beautiful, eloquent, and unique way, his personal keshe with, with the Rav. The person is currently the Rav of Kilat Or Dagan in the Dagan. And as many of you know, and many of you have been telling him, whether it be in Maledunim or Shalabim or Mevaseret, in many, many more places, the person has taken on the passion that he received from the Rav and has passed that torch on to so many lucky, lucky Tamidim and Tamidot. We consider ourselves amongst those that are very lucky. So, Ichavod Rav. There are a few things that Dr. Wolf said that really resonated for me, so meaningful. And I want to pick up on something that you said at the, at the end. And that is how much we're learning the Torah of Salvation. I'm not going to say that myself, that the day doesn't go by that I think about the Rav, but I would say this is a sugya doesn't go by that I don't think about the Rav. And it's tardy mash, but it's really good and bad. The good is that you're trying to match up to your Rebbe, you're trying to figure out what would he say. You know, it's like an image. What would Rav Salvation do with this sugya? How would he take it apart? We used to walk into Shia, and I had some Bar Hashem, some very good converses. One of my converses for most of my time in the Rav Shia had won a Westinghouse scholarship in high school. He went on to MIT, graduated in three different fields in two years. I mean, a, a genius among geniuses. And yet we would learn Chavrusa, and we would come into the Shia, and the whole sugi was just in, just in disarray. I mean, so many new factors. It's like, you know, anyone who finished Nazir, you know, like the last Sugi Nazir, like it's, you know, so much is in you at once. 
and it's all a balagan as we say here this year. And then you walk into the rough shear and you see how he develops, you know, the light of Torah. And the bad part of it is, and I speak not only on my own behalf, but of some of my friends, the standards are so high. You know, what do we remember 50 years after Mitch and the rough shear? I remember the one occasion we were learning the set Gittin, and I still remember the Tosas. You know, don't ask me which Tosas I learned yesterday, but ask me the Tosas that I learned in the Rav Shir, and I raised my hand, and I, he was stuck with a Rabbi Tom about uh, giving a get to a woman whose hands are closed and this and that, and I gave a, I gave a husband, and he wouldn't even let me finish. He said, yeah, good, good. And then he explained what I had said in 20 minutes. Then he looks at me, he says, first on, is that what you meant? I said, Rabbi, yeah, but he said it better than me. <laughs> But how do I remember this? this? This was something that, you know, made an indelible impression on me. But my father and I very often, you know, we cry about the fact that we can't, we can't reach those levels. It's so difficult. It's so impossible. Also, it's another thing. The rub was the sugar with the And that's creativity. He had to be original. To what extent? And I'm not being mechadish in the but I will, I'll confirm him. He would not even be willing to hear his own Torah. And I remember sitting next to Rabbi Yilson in Shia, and the Rav got stuck on his studio, and Chaim raised his hand and said, Rebbe, five years ago, and the Rav slammed his hand down on the table. He said, you forget what I said five years ago. You listen to what I say now. He was on my end on his gabin. We had a fellow who came from Rav Beryl Salvechik in, uh, in Yerushalayim. The Rav's first cousin, the Brisky Yeshiva. He had studied seven years. He did the whole cycle with Rebbe. And he started coming to the Rav Shir. He looked a little different than most of us. And he sat in the back. And one day we cornered him. And he said, Rabbi Dunner, could you compare our Rebbe to your Rebbe? Meaning this Rebbe to that Rebbe. And he said, my Rebbe Rebbe is Bechinas Nahar. He's a river. Your Rebbe is a Maya. My Rebbe carries the Torah from his father, the Brisk Guru. Your Rebbe is a spring. Everything he says is original. And it was like a Mishigas. It was like crazy. You know, Lawrence Kaplan says that, you know, he was involved in translating uh, the Ishalakha. And he says that he used to come every couple of weeks and go over the translation with him. And the Rav, in the middle of the translation, would start, would start philosophizing. It had nothing to do with exactly the text that they were translating. And Kaplan says that he could have made another ish halacha out of those discussions. The, the creativity is beyond belief. You know, they say about Hasidim, and this is a Litvish approach, that Hasidim will tell you my sin with You know, they'll tell you, they'll tell you stories about the, the Rebbe, you know, he did this miracle, he did that miracle. And, you know, the Litvox are very cynical about that. Come on, another Hasidim Shemaisa. But the only Hasidic Shemaisa I'm going to tell you about Ratzel is his creativity, his originality. It's my bargain. My father's and mother both used to attend the Tuesday night Shira Moriah. That, uh, I would say about 150, maybe 200 people used to come. It was in Yiddish. And uh, my father, as, as busy as the schedule as he had, he would make sure that he was there. One time he, come up, he came over to the rough after the Shira, and he said to him, Rebbe, I'm afraid I'm not going to get any schar, any reward for coming to Yeshia. The Rav turned white. He said, Rabbi Person, what do you mean? So my father said to him, look, I could have gone to an opera. I could have gone to a movie. I could have gone to the theater. I enjoy Yeshia. I get physical pleasure out of going to Yeshia. Physical pleasure. So the Rav answered in Yiddish. He said, das ace Dara Lishma. That's what Dara Lishma is all about. To have physical pleasure. Later on, I found that it's sin. The Malaj says, that you can have physical pleasure from Torah, physical pleasure. It was unbelievable. The clarity, they just to talk about the clarity would, would take us all night. I think the clarity of the bench, I mean, to, his expression when I came to the Shia, I had learned to there at Sistro for three years, and there was there was nothing like the rubs there. I mean, nothing that I had, and I was exposed to quite a few dollars, but it wasn't like the rub Shia. His clarity was amazing. Of course, it took me six months to understand his, his English. I mean, you know, 15-syllable words in a German accent. I didn't know what's flying. I had the luck, what? Yeah, and I came into the Shia. Guess what the Rav was teaching? Chulendachofei, Malika Bechatazov. 
How many people here are willing to hear a shia now on Malika Bachatas Oath? Yeah, take yourself a six month preparation period and then come back to me and we'll learn about Malika Bachatas Oath. So here I flew in from Eretz Yisrael after three years of learning. I didn't know what Malik is. I didn't know what a chattis was. I didn't know what an oath was. Okay. And uh, there I am, you know, and trying to figure out the man's English, you know. Uh, my friend Pinky Weinberg raised his hand and he goes, you know, you remember Pinky going, Woo. so the Russians, like, would you would you quell your curiosity for one moment? You know, like everything had to be a fancy, sophisticated English. The man was a poet. I mean, there's no question about it. But with the few moments that I have remaining, I want again add something and, and reiterate what, uh, what Dr. Wolf is saying. That is the, the personal touch. We in the Rav Shia, and anyone who was in the Shia will know exactly what I'm talking about. We would sit there. It was scary. You know, the Rav could get rough. In my period already, I was towards the end. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't so bad. But we had heard stories about the, the free and dictators, you know, how they, they sat in the Shia, and the Rav would, would smash at the Spinnerines. I have a relative, my family, who saw this happening. She came once to a public lecture, and the rub sort of made fun of somebody, and that's it. She said, I'm never coming to our, to our celebration again. That was what she couldn't tolerate. But I'll tell you this. There's another side to the rub. And this I saw when I came to introduce my Carla, who's now been my wife for over 45 years, to meet the rub. And we walk out. By the way, the, the chief rabbi of Israel Rav Garant was standing outside, and the Rav knew it, but he wanted to spend time with me and my Kala, and that's it. I walk out after about a half hour, and anybody knows my wife, Tarni, she says to me, that's the man you're afraid of? He's like a Zeta. <laughs> and that was the other side of the Rav, and my Dr. Wolf mentioned driving the Rav. I had a, a couple of vacations, so I drove the Rav, and I'll never forget, he, he used to ask me, well, what are you studying in college? So I said, I'm studying, I'm studying philosophy. So he said, oh, the science of Hakirs. That's what he called it. Beautiful definition. And I said, Rebbe, we're going over the Tribor Bridge. I'm on my way to college, and I'm going to pay for the toll. No, 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 you can't pay for the toll. It's like Yossi Adel once, who was one of the Bisharsen of the Rav, was asked by the Rav to go get him a cup of coffee. So the Rav gives him a quarter. And when Adler comes back with the coffee, so the Rub says to him, how much was it? So Adler, he made a mistake. He hesitated for a second. So that split second, the Rub says, well, how much was it? So Adler says it was 30 cents. So the next day, the Rub comes running at the shoe with the nickel. Where's Adler? <laughs> He's got to pay back. That's a risk of course. But, but there was another side to the Rub that we very rarely got to see. But when we saw it, you know, when I got married in New York, the Rav was in Boston because it was in August, and during the August period, he was in Boston, but he came in for my wedding. Again, I don't think he came in for my because he was more my father, but whatever it is, he came in. And it meant so much to me, you know, even to this day, when I look over my Hasidah pictures, I, I remind myself of all the things that the Rav said to me at my Hasidah, you know, one, you know, one response after the other. And we, I was only so to learn this year for five years, the fellow behind me, I don't know if anyone knows of Mikkel Shirkin Street, though, who's a neighbor of mine in Hanov, he was in the ship for 18 years. And it's not enough. You can never get enough. And every time you learn a sugi, to try to see if you can size up. How many times in my life would I say to myself, perhaps, the, could I say this to the Rav? Oh, would you go like this and tell me to go fly a kite? You don't know what you're talking about. Of course, he never got my name straight. You know, the Rav used to take attendance every day. A hundred names. And he used to get to my name, he used to say, Where's on Azaria? Azaria. So I tolerated this for three years, four years. Finally, I said, Rebbe, my name is not Azaria, it's Azaria, like Rebbe was about Azaria. Oh, oh, he goes. Next day, of course, he called me Azaria. <laughs> well, that didn't help much. But that was it. There was a certain Kesha, a certain relationship. My, my only taina that I have against Rav Salavajik, so to speak, and this, I, I don't know how to deal with this, is that there's certain achron that I, to this day, I cry that he didn't, ex he didn't expose us to these achron. Five years in the Shia, I never heard him quote that some sort. And I want to stay here with Ayam the Eidah, that after many, many years of learning, I can tell you that some sofa was a genius of geniuses. 
But the Rav's there was to teach us not to look anywhere. Nowhere. Even Rav Shishonim. I remember somebody brought in a Meiri to this year. Wow, the Meiri. No, no, no. He's not interested in the Meiri. Uh, I have a couple of uh, theories about that. I also, five years this year, I think he quoted the Ritva once. But basically, he wanted to be totally original. He never wanted to be straitjacketed and influenced by others. And I want to conclude with the following. How many Talmudians, excuse me, how many Talmudians of yeshivas? You know, I'm not from the academic world so much, although I, I do have an undergraduate and a graduate degree in philosophy, but in the academic world, there's certain, you know, shining lights and giants. So too, Mahavdil in the Torah world, there are giants. There are certain Talmudians, Chacham in Rosh Yeshiva. And I have a lot of friends who learned in many, many different yeshivas with many gold. But how many of my friends would say the following, that 50 years after I was in this year, I'm still learning his Torah. It is my Rebbe's Torah of salvation that keeps me going. Lately, I have another Rebbe. I was for Kabbalah, another Rebbe on my son. He's gone even before the Rebbe. Right? His, name, his name is the wrestler of Rebbe. And I, for, I was uh, heading up what's called the Amos Learning Center for a number of years, about 11 years, and I have a, a Talmud there. Maybe some of you would know him, Rabbi Goldscheider. Anybody know him? He's now the editor of the Torah. It's anyway, so Rabbi Goldscheider would sit in my class, and I would ask a question, and I would develop a, an idea from Rabbi Nelson of Breslin, and I would say, what would the Rav say about this? And then we'd make a comparison. And this is what I do here every Thursday night, except for tonight. And I try to explain, you know, on a certain mitzvah or an issue, how the Rav would approach it and how Hasidus would approach it. Of course, the Rav knew a lot more about Hasidus than I'll ever know. But he's the Rav Baruch. May his memory be a blessing for us. We should learn from him. You know, today, you know, they publish his Zionistic works. And, oh, that's great. You know, I love, I love reading anything from the Rav. And some of my friends, when it comes to the Rav's philosophy, you know, all right. They're not interested. But the truth is, and I'm waiting for someone to do a PhD thesis on this, to show how the Rav's Derek and Libut influenced his philosophical thinking. And I have no doubt in my mind that the dialectics and the Tzaytidim and the classification and the definition and the precise way of analyzing things in all of the Rav's writings really, really is rooted in his Torah. May we be so good to learn his Torah, and he should have an alias to show up as his Talmudian, remember him so fondly, and continue in his pair of Katie Rex on Monday. Thank you. Thank you so much, for Azaria. Very nice. <laughs> um, nearly 21 years ago, I was privileged to move here. And uh, I didn't know much about the yeshiva I was going to, Mamash, but it was the, the greatest, greatest maskina that I, I could have ever received coming from Los Angeles and coming to Shivat of time. And I was placed in, in, uh, in the sheer of someone who could completely change the way, I, I shouldn't even say change the way I learned, I don't think I ever learned. Can consider any learning I did till I got here to be learning. That was the Shir of Rabbi Menachem Shreden. And I remember we were learning, it was in Elul at Elul, we did a, a Surya in Nazim. And I never in my I never learned like this before. And it took me, it took me, it's still taking me a lot of time to wrap my head around this way. But for us, more than just more than just the the, the, the sheet that we were learning. Learning, learning with Rav Schrader was something that, till today, all of our chaverim that were still a very tight knit group of friends. It's, it's a very beautiful thing. Friends have met in the yeshiva and stayed very, very close till today. We have so many memories. We have so many fond memories and such a colors to those years we were zochet to be in Rav Schrader's shir. I think that was in shir for approximately three years, and it, it gives me a tremendous, a tremendous, tremendous amount of, of Hodat HaShem to have this close to call it my Rebbe Rav Menachem Shreger to share with us some more this time. Thank 
Thank you, Ashlyn. Okay. I just want to challenge Rav Berdan to write the book that he suggested yeah, someone so else get a PhD for. Then we're going to translate the Shiva Sekhar Okay. <laughs> Who uh, could easily have been at the Dennis team. I'm going to try to speak about what I thought I was supposed to speak about, uh, which is a description of the rough shear. Now, it's uh, sort of an, an unfair responsibility, but uh, we'll try to put across whatever we can put across in that context. First, at the drop of history. The stories, uh, and this was already mentioned uh, by uh, Rick Berzon and Rabbi Wolf as well, uh, that when the Rav gave Shear when he was much younger than at the time that uh, we studied on it, and people walked into the shear literally frightened. Uh, the stories of them feeling nauseous, the worst stories, um, the, uh, the, rub, the rub called on you to read, you, you sort of fell apart, and, and uh, the uh, the, the demands were uh, very high, very powerful, and I'm not saying it strongly enough. It, it, it was a frightening experience. Um, and uh, it is said, and I'm sure this was the case, that the rub would walk in uh, to say the word prepared is a, a deep understatement. He knew the last line of the sheer moment he walked in, and uh, he was getting there, and he, he got there. Uh, Father Shapiro would say otherwise, and he the beard, and he's going to say. By the time we learned by the Rav, the Rav had mellowed quite a bit. He did not frighten us. He walked into the shear uh, calmly, and uh, he took a kind of uh, a grandfatherly attitude towards uh, the Talmudim of the shear. It doesn't mean that we weren't frightened out of our minds if we actually did get called up. We, we certainly were, but um, nevertheless. It, it, it was, there was something comfortable about the shear, and uh, especially as the years went on. And it seemed to us, and I think uh, both sitting at the table uh, and the audience can say what they think, that the rub did not have the final statement of the shear prepared. The rub walked in certainly knowing everything he wanted to talk about but didn't necessarily know exactly how it was going to end. And the, the interchange and the exchange with Tamid and Shir went a long way towards creating the final, uh, the final conclusion that the Shir actually uh, presented. And it, uh, it was almost worked out sometimes together. Uh, of course, uh, it was from the rub, but uh, it, it, it came from within the context of, of the dialogue in the shir, and not exclusively from what he was presenting. <laughs> there was a deep sense that we were attending the greatest Shiurim, the greatest shir on tradition in the world, from the greatest Mechadesh in the world. 
the reason for that feeling was because that was the case. And um, there's just nothing quite like that. The Ruff approached every Gemara as if it were the first time he was seeing it. Even though by and large she had seen it and taught it often many times before. But he insisted on taking a fresh approach. You already mentioned this, right? Yeah. It once happened that the Rav was, uh, was giving Shir on the Gemara that he had written an article about. It was published, and it had frankly been seen by uh, at least a few of the Talmud and the Shir. I can't say about the majority, but uh, it was known <laughs> that the article had been written, and uh, we figured it was appropriate to study the article in preparation for the Shir. It was also known that, that although the Rav did not quote the Chazon Ish in the article, but that the whole thrust of the article was to contradict the approach of the Chatonish to that particular Sylvia. It was a completely different approach. In context of giving the Shir, the Rav came to the conclusion that the Chatonish came to. Rabbi Nachum Ganak, who uh, first certainly, amongst others, but certainly first raised his hand and said, but the Rav wrote that so-and-so, yeah, the opposite. The Rav said, so what? So that's what I wrote. This is what I think right now. Like the Chazanish. Fine. Wasn't the problem. And um, I don't know that the article, or that any article was ever written uh, on that cheer of that day. The article that the Rav wrote uh, I'm sure continues to be studied. But the Rav uh, actually, on that day at least, came to a different conclusion and stood by. The Shir was the study of Halacha B'iyun. That may seem like uh, isn't that obvious? Well, it, it certainly was obvious, but uh, it is in distinction to uh, the method of uh, Talmudic study, even in yeshivas, that's currently going on. It was complete focus on understanding in the maximal depth of what each line in the Gemara was saying, to the nth degree. We were expected to come as far as we could before we walked into the shear. And then the Rav inevitably took us beyond that. But the notion of covering ground didn't exist. It, it, was, not, uh, it was not a matter. It didn't matter at all. What mattered was understanding to the greatest possible depth, whatever it was we were studying. And it's important to mention something else. Uh, both uh, Rabbi Wolf and, and, and Rabbi Berzin spoke of, uh, uh, of the Hashkafa articles of the Rav, which are uh, crucial in the study of uh, Hashkapa of the Rav and uh, of Torah B'chlau and uh, what Rav Berzin, uh, the article that Bezrat Hashem Rav Berzin plans on writing uh, about the connection between the, the Rav's Hashkapa and uh, the, the Rav's Sadera Chalimud will, will show how important this is. But the, um, it must be said that in the Shir, it was no hashkafa whatsoever. Rarely, rarely did the Rav discuss any of the Agadita that we came across. If he did, it was almost always in terms of its connection to the halacha per se. I'm not saying the Rav didn't have many other occasions to discuss hashkafa. It's, it's, uh, 
it goes without saying the, 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 the Joshua said he gave where the focus on the relationship between Allah and Ashkafa was paramount. And uh, these were written up and uh, said the Rabbi Allah has sitting on the table. Uh, but in the Shir itself, it was pure halacha bi'iyun. And uh, it was almost shying away from any possibility of uh, a kind of a, a distraction of hashkafa that might have come out. In the last year I was in the Shia Rav on Thursday, we put aside a certain time to give Shia Manchomish, something which I believe he did in Boston much more frequently, I think on a regular basis. Um, it is worthy of another PhD, or not a PhD, at least an explanation, to explain the unique approach that the Rav had towards teaching Chomish, uh, not just in terms of the sources that he used, which were, of course, uh, the Mufarshi Chazal and the Midrash, the Mufarshi on the Chumash, I should say, of, uh, of the Yishonim and the Midrash, but the, uh, where he was going, where he was taking it, what he was trying to get us to get out of it, is, was a limud in its own right, and something which uh, has not been discussed sufficiently, as far as I, as far as I know. The Rav would focus in sheer on teaching Marashi and Tosfos and the Rambam, with dealing with almost all the Balamar and Melchema Sashem on the Sibyos. Frequently having a study and teaching the Chidushe Aramban, once in a while another Misham, not much else, as was already mentioned. And the goal of the teaching of these Mufarshim was to elucidate the Gemara itself. Yes, it was a focused understanding every word, every meaning in particular, certain key phrases that they were using. But the goal was always to get the deeper, the deepest possible understanding of the halacha and the Gemara. The Rav is uh, famous for being the maintainer and the continuer of the brisker death. But we have to understand what that means in this context. And uh, this was alluded to already by, uh, by Rabbi Berzin. The point was not to tell over what Rukhain said. Quite the contrary. Uh, Rav would say sometimes, we don't necessarily say what Rukhain says. Rukhain paved the roads for us. But the conclusions, you know, the, the Rav would often quote what the, his grandfather, Rukhain Rizka, or his father would say on a particular sugya, but he, he, was, he was not necessarily bound to what they said at all. He would say his own ideas. He would come to his own conclusions. And in terms of the Sefer, Chedishiri, Rabbi Nuchayim, Halevi, and the Rambam, I don't think he opened it in Shir even once, maybe once. Houston, he once said that uh, when they brought the book in, that's where he saw it. Yeah, he said, okay, because I heard it also by first hand. The Reb Chaim's usually quoted weren't in the Sefer. The ones that were in the Sefer, he often didn't quote, maybe not even hold from sometimes. The, the Masoret of, of his grandfather was very much a Torah Shabbat then. And if it happened to get written down, it, it, it was almost a violation of Bram Shabal Peya Tarasha Omran Buksa. It was a Masoret of what Rukhain said. And even then, it had to be evaluated, studied, questioned, and uh, responded to.
In the first year that we learned, uh, I was in the Shear. As about halfway through the year, the Rav started learning the Sechas Chala on Thursdays. We would learn the Mishnayas, so consulting the Yushalmi is so appropriate. So excuse me if I'm bad saying this. There was a time when I pictured the daf of uh, Masechus Chava with uh, the Rambam on one side of the daf and the Rash on the other side of the daf with the Shimshon Mishans. As almost being on the shoulders, the Rambam on one shoulder and the Rash on the other shoulder of the Rav himself. The, uh, the elucidation that he would bring to each of the shittas in explaining the mission. No doubt there were Talmudim who had a very personal relationship with the Rav. But the essential relationship established with the, the Rav was the study of the Torah itself that he was teaching and the interaction within that context. And primarily within the context of the Shir. No doubt people who lived in Boston had a completely different experience and uh, I know that to be the case. But in New York, in YU, it was primarily the Shir and the Torah that we got within that context. already mentioned, but it's worth reiterating. The approach to Talmud Torah was completely within the context of Lumbus. There was no academic study of the university style at all. The shear as he gave it to us could have been given in any shiva in the world. And frankly, they would have died to have it. Only the, uh, it's known that Rabbi Kamenetsky wanted the Rav to be Rosh Hashim together with him in Torah Vadas, something the Rav refused. He wants to ask, what? The um Can you say something? I can't remember what I said. It's good. Sorry, must be, shouldn't have said. The Ruff had great respect for the Talmud and the Shir. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it was really an amazing uh, sense of one got from him. Not that he accepted everything we had to say, far from it. But he was very open to hearing what the Talmudim said, in particular those who he had known over the years and had come to respect their views, would often, or at least sometimes, accept what they said over his own ideas. And uh, this was the rough, not just any. The fear of being called upon, I mentioned before, was great, but we all survived. And as already mentioned, the Rav was not impressed, almost not interested in the analysis of uh, the earlier uh, Rashi Yeshiva or Akronim, or even later Rishonim. He wanted to work it all out himself. This was no doubt essential for him internally, first of all. But more importantly, we weren't going to gain from it all being worked out for us by reading it in a Vigiri or in Iran. We were going to gain from seeing the Rav work it out himself 
together with us or on his own by seeing and experiencing the thought process with him, he was developing Talmidu that would, as Rabbi Hashem, be able to continue. I'm going to end with something that I think the previous speakers have already alluded to, but maybe we can say it more clearly, or maybe not more clearly. <coughs> The Rav said on a number of occasions that he was successful in teaching Talmidim how to learn. He felt that he taught them to be Lamdonim in the greatest possible way, and that he felt that he, I've like said it sometimes, that when we, his Talmidim, were able to come to a mathematical understanding of the subjects that uh, we were learning. What he felt he failed at was presenting the emotion, the masoret of Torah Shabbat and to the Talmudin in the fullest sense of that expression with all the feeling that should be accompanied with it. That he felt he didn't go to course. He said this at least. Whenever he would say it, I would take it as a challenge, prove that he was wrong. We're still trying. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, before we hear from our final speaker, I, I just want to remember, I have a memory cut while the Reverend was speaking right now, but that was mentioned so often about the Talmudian being frightened to be called upon. We were frightened, actually, to be called upon as well. There was one person in our shear, a little bit older, a little bit of a jokester, a musician, he should, he should be well. And he saw that the young Bechever, we were petrified. So I'll never forget on two occasions when we were learning, we were, I think we were learning a Mordechai. And then the Rav asked, okay, so what, does, what, what, what are you thinking? What do you think right now? So each person did say, I remember I froze. And then the person, I mentioned his name, it was his turn to say the answer. He wanted to calm us down and he said, I'm thinking of chopping wood for a widow. Just to, because he was answering, he was thinking about Hasidic Shatil that he, that he learned the night before about some night that goes and chops wood for a widow. And each of us just started breathing for a few minutes. And then on another occasion, when we were very, very nervous and she had to be called upon and it was clear, and he tried to break the ice. So I'll never forget this. The Rav asked, So what do you think right now? What, what, what do you want to say? Each of us, each of us gave our answer. And then he said, I'm really thinking that I should have told Yossi Bain last night, but I really wanted to tell him. <laughs> he had seen him in the, in the La Rome and the Imbal Hotel, and that's what he was thinking at that moment. I don't know if anyone ever had the folks look and speak like that man. And in the rough shoe, it's a great deal. There's a story about how <laughs> the Rapayan went to Rapayan from his father. He said, What are you thinking about? He said, Nothing. He yelled at him, he screamed at him. So the next time that happened, Thinking about, I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about what's the din of a of an androgynous Kohen who's 12 years of one day old and goes into a cemetery. Does that marvelous, right? So whether what what, what kind of what is the, what is how severe is how severe is the infraction because the third the male side is not yet 13, but the girl, but there's no. Is there for a girl for a real thing? I mean, however, it might be also for the 12 year old, for the 12 year old girl to actively defile the. You'll find me the rest. That would have been better. So, for our final speaker, I want to give a bit of a to talk to Rabbi Ivan Adler, who really was the one that um, really planted the seed that we could have this evening in memory of the Rub. 
And after, I find it it's just a great gift for me after having known Rabbi Lam back in Malay Domime now for a number of years, we're here in a flat with Rabbi Lam Adler for 25 years, 25 years we were in Rabbi in, uh, both in Connecticut and in Maryland, in Baltimore. Or Hashem has made Aliyah and has brought such a light and such a, a unique, unique way of, of and with the perspective we're going to be hearing from the Rabbi Adler tonight, it'll be different than what we heard until now. And I won't say anything more, you'll, you'll hear why. So, the Chavod Rav, Rabbi Adler, thank you so much. Thank you very much, sir. So, for the lovely introduction. This thing down. This thing down. Oh, that's good. I don't open that one. Great. Thank you. So, Basel Tab on the first year of the show, and uh, you have very unique talents and capabilities that have made it happen. And the uh, Kate Yearbook for many, many more years. I mean, I mean. So, um, you may have noticed when our three previous speakers were talking about uh, the Rav Shear and etc., and they were talking about like inside things. Remember when the Bill go and dropped his pencil? <laughs> um, well, I was not. I was not a Talmud of the Rav, so I don't exactly fit into this panel. But so you would you would say to me, so why are you here? And the reason I'm here is because. As the Rav was advancing in his years, he enjoyed uh, a retinue of individuals who would help him with various things. Uh, take him here, take him there, accompany, be with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so for two years, uh, in the early 80s, I was one of those who was uh, one of his, as we would say, Mishartim, one of his assistants, not intellectual assistant, but in aid, A-I-D-E. And uh, again, that I did for two years. So I'd like to speak from that perspective. So if anybody's uh, waiting for any kind of lumbness of any sort, you ain't gonna get it. You're just gonna get a few personal snapshots uh, that I observed and still touch me to this day. Uh, thoughts and teachings of the Rav that uh, accompanied me through my 25 years in the Ravnit and beyond. Uh, things that I still repeat in my in teaching classes, things that I, I use when I do life cycle events, um, and things that I often use when I do counseling. But we'll get to that in just a moment. So I was at Yeshiva University from 1978 to 1986. And when the Rav was on campus, his presence was pervasive. Whether you saw him at an event or not, his presence was pervasive. His influence was sweeping. And his attendance at any event literally made the event. That's how iconic he was on campus. So he would say to me, how did you become a Mishare to the Rav? There are several who took turns with him, as I mentioned, around the clock. You, you might say, how did I get involved? And I would, I would say I would be the least uh, likely to be in this kind of position. Um, I lived in Providence, Rhode Island while I was going to Yeshiva University. And Motzei Shabbat, we would go to the Maimonides School, and the only other name tonight that's been quoted more often is the name of uh, Rabbi David Shapiro, so I'll do it again. Who was the head of Maimonides, what, 40 years? There, give or take 40 years. <laughs> out of 40 good years, out of how many? I'm just kidding. <laughs> 40 beautiful years. And so Moshe Shabbat, the Rav would have a cheer. I, I would estimate back to 500 people, was it? Give or take, hundreds of people would come with their steno pads. Everybody's ready with their pens and pencils uh, to take all kinds of notes. And I always remember at the end of this year, it's not like I went every Moshe Shabbat, I went often, but not every. And every time I would say to myself, I, I want to go and shake his hand. I want to just shake the man's hand. But it was very, very hard to do that because after he finished a shear, there was an, an entire line 
of people who wanted to ask him a question or get a clarification or whatever. And every time we went, I said, just give me a minute to the people in my car. I just want to shake his hand. But uh, as it happened, I was never able to do that. So it was just a watching. It was a listening uh, and leaving disappointed that I could never actually shake the rub saying, okay, that's the way it goes. Now I'm at the Yeshiva University cafeteria, and I overheard from a group of his Mishar team, some of the other ones who take the R in the rotation. I heard that they were saying that the Rav that particular week didn't want to travel back to Boston alone. And he would fly. He would fly in on Tuesdays, leave on Thursdays. And um, I think it was called People Express. Do you remember this? $29 each way. You brought your own chair. There was no oxygen. He used to fly Easter. At Easter one point, the Eastern people brought him a clothes. Oh, uh, he flew back to Boston, back and forth to Boston so many times that he had actually gone 25,000 miles. They brought him a cloak, they brought him to the apartment. As he was sitting in the apartment, there was a cloak. Oh, so it was given to him. There you go. <laughs> Did not know. In any case, so they were saying, all right, about what are we going to do? So I'm listening uh, in the cafeteria, which at which I was present 95% of my time at each university. But uh, so I, I walked over to the table. I said, you know, I'm, I'm happy to volunteer. You would? Like, who are you? Well, I live in Providence. Providence to Boston is an hour by bus. I'm happy to go with the road to the, uh, to the airport, sit with them on the airplane, and then take the bus from Logan in Boston and go to Providence. You would do that? Yeah, let me check my schedule. I think I've got a manicure at about the same time. Let me see if I can cancel that. Of course, you know, give up such a scoot. Of course, I'm very, very happy. And they said, okay, okay, so there we go. We're in the car. Somebody drove the car and they're dropping us off. And there I'm sitting next to Rob Soloveitchik, right next on the plane. And this is cool. This is very, that's a lot of fun. Maybe fun is not the right word, but this is great. What an opportunity and a great time to shake the man's hand. Hi, oh, I'm that all amazing. Anyway, it was very, very nice. We had a nice flight. We both slept. It was a great flight. I took the Greyhound bus back to Providence, and this happened a handful of times. So at some point, somebody leaves the rotation for one reason or another, and they need a replacement. And I said, you know, I would be available. At that time, I was head of the high school dormitory. With about 95 uh, residents every year at the high school dormitory. Remember that? By Danny Ryan? Yeah, high school dormitory. And uh, they said, the people in the uh, circle who did the rotation, they said, before you're approved, you have to be interviewed by Rabbi Chaim Salavetic, the son of Rabbi. That's correct. That's exactly right. If you ever saw an orange juice squeezer, this was what it was like to be interviewed by the Chaim Salavage, who grilled me for, I felt like I was in burgers, right? He grilled me for over an hour, asked me all kinds of questions, issues, concerns, what needed to be done, uh, what kind of sen sensitivities were called for to be part of this rotation. And then uh, he said the following, what happens in the apartment stays in the apartment, which was almost ready for me to walk away because I love gossip. And I'm saying, no, it's not true. I like gossip, I don't love that. So that was already a, a problem. Well, what happens in the apartment? I mean, you know, who wouldn't want to talk about what goes on in such an apartment? What happens there stays there. He said, I have to warn you before you're accepted into this rotation, you may not be taken advantage of and people will constantly want to take advantage of the fact that you are one of his Mishar team. You are a Shamus of the Rav. People will know that, and they will make up any excuse to come in and speak with them, ask a Shaila, get a clarification, do a this, do a that, take a picture with them, whatever. Don't, you have to be careful. You, if you're gonna be a nice guy about it, and you're gonna let people walk all over you, this is not for you. You have to be a faithful gatekeeper. There's a protocol and you have to stick to it. And then he said, you have to keep in mind, I'll never forget this, you have to keep in mind that my father is an international treasure. Oh my gosh. Okay, 
So I was accepted, which was extremely unexpected because I was not the son or the grandson of a well-known YU Rav, like the Rav of the young Israel of Yehopitz or something like that. I was not anything like that. I was not a relative of the greater Soloveitchik family. I was relatively new on campus. I was not a student in the Rav Shir. I was like out of the orbit. And I was not Jewish. So <laughs> anyway, so I'm accepted and it's uh, wonderful. And there was a daily schedule every time of who's coming, who's going, who's who. So I was Tuesday, two to seven, right after the Rav Shir, two o'clock to seven, Wednesday, two to seven again. And occasionally on Thursdays, if you need a bride or if you need uh, somebody to be in the apartment for a few hours, whatever. And we got a list of phone numbers, which was very, very impressive. It was a list of doctors, well-known people, a who's who of Jewish national, international personalities. Anyway, it was a very, very surreal experience for those two years. I want to share with you just a few scenarios that have stuck with me. Um, <clears throat> One time, one out of many times, when the president of Yeshiva University at that time, Rabbi Norman Lambs of Florida Rocha, uh, he would come and want to talk to Rabbi Soloveitchik. One time, the door is knocking. Who is it? It's Rabbi Norman Lamb. Oh, very nice. Lamb, that's, I think, uh, our face up. But okay, Rabbi Norman Lamb is there. I've, I've come to see the Rav. One minute, please. One minute, please. So I go over to the rug, he's sitting in his chair, and he hated this. I would potchkey with the whole thing, and with the hair, I'd bring over a brush. You know, should look. And he went over no, no, you don't have to do this. You know, I said, no, it's Rabbi Lane. Anyway, so the, I, the Rav said, would you please help me to go and greet him at the door? We went to greet Rabbi Lane at the door. Rabbi Lane comes in, they're having a wonderful conversation. I, um, sometimes I left the apartment. Sometimes I was asked to leave, not to leave, whatever. Anyway, I'm listening here and there. Can't tell you anything about what they spoke about because frankly, I don't remember. And thanks for putting Geritol in all of these. This was fabulous. What a great idea. Anyway, so Rabbi Lamb leaves and I, and I went over to the rabbi and I said, look, Rebbe, let me ask you a question. He's your student. Why wouldn't you have Rabbi Lamb coming over to you as opposed to you going over to the door and greeting him? And he said, he may be my student, but he's still the president of Yeshiva University. And I thought that was a beautiful, beautiful thing to say. There was one time right before Rosh Hashanah that the Rav asked to speak to Rav Moshe, related, wanted to wish you, cousin, one who wish each other a, a good year, etc. I mentioned this to Rabbi Tendler, to Kona Bracha, and Rabbi Tendler says, I'm sorry, we don't like to give out the number of Rav Moshe, but why don't you give me the Rav's number and we'll make a connection. It was very, very nice. So uh, the next day, the Misharet for Rav Moshe is calling me the Misharet for Rabbi Soloveitchik. And the only thing I can think of is Mishartav. Show Ali. <laughs> this is a classic. You know, there we are, losing with each other. Uh, and then, you know, when Moshe comes on the phone, and then I, you know, they, they had a wonderful, wonderful conversation together. And as they're speaking, I kind of got the feeling like the world was in a good place here, you know, with these two Gedolim speaking to each other, wishing each other, and wishing the world a, a beautiful year. It was really, really lovely. There was one time when five Young women from Stern asked me if they could come in and speak to Rav Soloveitchik about a, a host of issues of halacha, uh, women, etc. And they did ask him a lot of questions. He had a lot of patients. And one girl asked about tefillin. Tefillin. And um, he said his understanding was that there was a certain time, and he wasn't able to identify the certain time. But he said that there was a certain time where the women asked Chazal, now, how did they do that? You know, there's no WhatsApp for Chazal at that time, but you can reach all of them. But he understood that it was a certain period of Jewish history where the women asked Chazal to be absolved of certain mitzvot so that they can do what they felt was their obligation, etc. And he said to the women, young ladies, he said, if 
women as a whole, Jewish women as a whole, would re-accept the mitzvah of tefillin. He looked at each one of them separately. He said, if that happens, I would be the first to buy you each a pair of tefillin. Which was very, I, I don't know if that appeared anywhere, but I just went and gossiped. That's pretty good. <laughs> In any case, so, uh, but that's what he said. And he said it very beautifully. And he was so sensitive and so kind and so lovely. And I'll use the word, nobody's used it word. He was delicious. There was a delicious quality about Rav Soloveitcher. You know, almost a yeah. He wanted to go over and give a pinch, which I could have because I was all over his face anyway when the other men would come in. Uh, there was one time when one of the Lichtenstein grandsons uh, was ready to go to Long Island or somewhere and give a, give a shear. And uh, the Rav asked him, do you have any, I don't see your notes. Where are your notes? And he said to him, Zadie, I've given this shear many, many times. And the Rav said to him, even though you've given it many, many times, you really should have something written in your pocket. And whichever one it was, I mean, it might have been Yitzhi, whoever it was, paused for a few moments, sat down at the table and wrote out a few notes. And I thought that was really great. And what I learned from that in my rabbit was that whenever I go anywhere where I'm invited just to be a participant at a, at a bris or whatever, I always have something in my pocket because I never know when somebody would, oh, Rabbi Adler, oh, would you like to give a little, huh? No, I only came to watch the bris and frankly eat. <laughs> I'm not, but so ever, since then, boom, I'm always having something, whether it's in my pocket or in my head, which is emptier than my pocket, but I'm always uh, happy to have some kind of a thought. If you were to say to me, when was your smicha? When, what is the official anniversary of your smicha? The real anniversary is April 6th. That was the Chaga smicha in 1986. The unofficial smicha was uh, <clears throat> Rabbi Chalab. Is he still with us? Rabbi Chalap, who was then the dean, right, was the dean of the, of the rabbinic school, um, he came in to meet with Rav Salvechik, and for some reason the lights were not working very well, and they were looking, they were learning in the back of the Gemara. Now, if, if you know anything about the back of an average Gemara, like a full Gemara, the big letters are out in front, and then you go to the back, and oh my God, you can't, you can hardly read, you can hardly read the letters because they're so tiny. And both of them said, Elon, would you please come over and read this for us? I, I don't know what the subject is. I have no idea what they're talking about. I can hardly see the letters. And I'm just, I'm struggling. I'm struggling trying to read it. But as I'm reading it, one of the other would say, oh, good, good, good. So what he's saying is blah, blah, blah. Continue, bite him, bite him. I'm trying to read another two lines and I can hardly make, I can't make sense of it. Because I'm not in the sugya. I don't know what they're talking about. I'm just merely reading. Oh, good, good, good. So what did the, anyway, that lasted for about a half an hour. I was schwitzing, schwitzing, because this is a, a, a pressure cooker to be reading for these two people. But at the very end, they said, thank you very much. You did a great job. So to me, that was like my unofficial uh, smicha that I received. A little sense of humor from the rug. There was one time where 15 of what I would say, looking at them at that time, 15 of the biggest rabbis in American schools came to talk to the rug about various kinds of issues. And very often they would mention something about what would the halacha committee say about this? What would the halacha committee say about that? What would the halacha committee say? And okay, they're talking for about two hours. They finally leave. And I go over to the rug and I say, Rebbe, uh, who are the members of the halachic committee? And he said, you're looking at them. <laughs> okay. Got that clarification. Just mention a couple of quick things and I'll say something about this safer. Um, the Rav taught me, and it could have been published in books, I have no idea, but this happened in the apartment or outside the apartment. Um, I remember once asking the Rav, what does it mean when the Gemara says that when we go up 
to Shemayim and were asked various questions. Like, did you gossip about anything in the apartment? I don't think that's one of them, but uh, different questions. Uh, uh, did you study um, consistently? You know, did you Kovea eating la Torah? Uh, did you Asakta the Pirga Verbibia? All these various interesting kind of questions. And there's a string of them. And at, at the very end is a phrase called, it says, Sipita li Yeshua, which we would understand as, did you await? The Mashiach. Did you await redemption? See, Pita and Yeshua. So I said to the to the rock, you know, with all the other ones, there are observable and discernible ways that you can tell if a person did this or that. Did you procreate? I don't know if you remember in New York, Warner Wolf. Was that his name? Warner? Warner Wolf? The sportscaster? Let's go to the videotape, right? With all these other ones, let's go to check it out. Check out my life. Did you procreate? Yes or no? Did I establish times for studying the Torah? Check the, uh, the video of my life. It's right there. How do you detect or discern somebody who has anticipated redemption? How do you do that? How do you measure that? So he said, and by the way, whatever he said, he didn't go, oh, let me think of that. Uh, redemption, redemption. Right, boom, right away. He said, what the Gemara is saying is, did you give up or look up? When life is throwing all the challenges at you, when everything is going down the tube, when you've got more than you can handle, did you give up or did you look up? Now, if I haven't used that a hundred times at a funeral, counseling, the bar Torah, then I didn't even use it once. Last thing, there's a couple of other things, but I see that uh, time is uh, precious. Thursday night, etc. There was one time where uh, somebody, I won't mention the name because everybody will know him. Somebody asked, could I please one time accompany you on the ride to the airport. Now that's such a violation of what I'm not supposed to do. I said to him, only on one uh, promise, you're gonna sit in the back seat and you're not gonna say a word because I don't want the rough to know that there's anybody else in the car. I'm not proud of this, I'm just like, this is what happened. But it, it yielded something that was so precious, okay? So whoever, let's call this guy Bill, okay? Bill comes into the car and the rub is sitting next to me in the front. And before we turn up, I turn back and go and say, <laughs> zip it, Bill, zip it. And he was very quiet for a few minutes. And all of a sudden, Bill says, Rebbe, I'm saying, I can't believe it. I cannot believe it. I told him to zip it, and he's not zipping. And those were the days before Wade. So it wasn't Wade saying anything out of the phone saying, Rebbe, <laughs> this is a live human being in the back seat asking something, and I told him to be quiet. <laughs> yes? Rebbe, I was wondering if I could ask you a question. So I thought my revolver is loaded. <laughs> it's loaded. You picked the bad day here. So, anyway, what ensues? He asks the Rebbe, the Rav, and I don't know why he asked this. How does the Rav feel about people acting their age? <laughs> this, this is like the burning bush issue of your lifetime. You've got you know, I've got a Hador here, and, and next next to him is the Rav. <laughs> I'm kidding. Yeah, yeah, I've got, I've got the Gadol this, this is your big issue. How does the Rav feel about people acting their age? I felt like if there was an ejecto button that would fling the door open and grab them by them and just throw them out of the highway, far from LaGuardia, I would be the happiest person alive. I couldn't believe this is going on. <laughs> How does the rough feel about people acting their age? So the rough says, 
well, I don't know if he said well. Rav says, <laughs> so he just a tamtit of what he said. He said, personally, I believe people should act their own age, whatever it is. Whatever their age is, they shouldn't act older, shouldn't act younger, shouldn't have Abba, whatever he said. He says, like, for example, we've described Sarah. She was 120 and seven. So the Mepharshim have different things to say about why it was split up that way. But he said, the way I understand it is, at the age of 100, she perfected what it was like to be the grand lady. At the age of 20, she perfected what it was like to be that youth. And at the age of seven, she perfected the age of being a child. In other words, she was perfect at every age, meaning she acted the age and gave it the honor and the integrity it deserved. Whatever the age she was perfect at. So he says, that's why I believe that people should act like that. Now, uh, so I see uh, Rabbi Dr. Jeffrey, when I mentioned that, he's like nodding, like over. Oh, that's already a lovely thing to say. It's already beautiful. And then the rough continues. He says, by the way, when it talks about Abraham uh, giving a eulogy for Sarah, it says there, that he came to eulogize Sarah and to cry for her. And he says, you know, it's almost an excessive crying. He came to eulogize, he came to cry. And he says, do you know why it says or indicates an excessive crying? It's two phrases indicating his emotions. Do you know why it says that? And this was a gem, and I've used this 200 times. He says it says that because in one death, Abraham lost so many people. He lost the old woman, he lost the youth, and he lost the little child, which is in every one of us. That was worth Bill coming into the vaccine. That was absolutely worth it. So I just want to say this. Uh, it started out with, I'm going to shake that man's hand. And there was one time when the Rev had to uh, have an extended period of convalescence back in, uh, in Boston, in Brooklyn, I guess. And um, they needed somebody to stay with the Rev uh, the last night before he was going back to Boston. And I ended up uh, literally sleeping in the bed next to his. I only say that because <clears throat> look at the bookends. The bookends are one day I'm going to shake this man's hand and at the end of this whole thing, there I am in his bedroom. Is that not bizarre? <laughs> that is totally bizarre in my book. Anyway, when this safer came out, Shiri Mazeka of Amari Sal, um, the rough signed several copies to his Mishartim. So I'll tell you what he wrote. He wrote this. I used to have about 200 books signed by the author. This was the most precious. I have a, uh, a, a Chumash signed by the author. Okay. <laughs> but it's just, you know, for the sake of this evening, it's just not as precious as this. I just have to say. Listen to what he writes. Letal me die. Hane'amanim to my students, my tr trustworthy students, shenahagu v'chein u'v'chesed. This is to my students who dealt with me with kindness and generosity, gentleness, compassion. It's very, very beautiful. Many signed it, Yosef Do Halevi Salavitri. So it's right here, it's very nice. The only glitch is when, when I received it from one of the other Mishra, oh, the Rav left this for all tell me it said, wow, very, very nice. And for some reason, I looked in the back and I saw that he inscribed this. Benechdi Achabib Maran Meir Eliyahu Lichtenstein. May 8th, no. Yosef Dov Halevi. Anyway, so I thought, wow, I'm not he. And he is not me. 
So I got in touch, and it was only recently, only recently I got in touch with, uh, with, uh, with uh, was it Mayor? Or Mayor Salamajic? And I said to him, listen, I, I think I've got your safer. I don't even think it, I know it. I know it because <laughs> there, there's an inscription here in the back. I think I'm your safer. Uh, tell me what to do with it. And I, of course, I'm hoping you will say, keep it. And he said, I have several others. Why don't you keep it? And so I've kept it. But I haven't just kept the safer. I've kept so much of what he did and said, his affect, his generosity of time. People came to see him from all over the place for different reasons. A chatan and kala for a bride. Knock, knock, who is it? The chief rabbi of Britain. Oh, one moment. Knock, knock, who is it? Avital Sharansky. Oh, okay. Knock, knock, who is it? The who is who would come and visit. And one of the most often examples is Rabbi Norman Lenz at Salm. And frankly, uh, because he came so often, I was able to walk into his office with no appointment. That was worth just about everything. Anyway, so thank you for listening. And uh, we should all continue to be touched by the Rub's legacy, his brilliance, his humanity, and uh, 30 years. For those of us who knew him very perfectly, is, is, it, is it hard to believe it's 30? It's, it's yeah. 30. <clears throat> Long time to be without. Anyway, appreciate your listening. Thank you so much for this wonderful evening. Okay. So, without any right now, to make you crash, which is two floors, the elevator is minus one.